All right, so now we're going to move on to Chapter 5, Newton's Laws of Motion. Um, we're going to start with, um, we're going to start drawing force diagrams and talking about how, um, how objects move under forces. So, or sorry, free body diagrams. Um, so free body diagrams are a way of illustrating what the total forces on some object are. Um, and what you're going to do is, so basically most of these problems are some type of word problem. You're going to start by sketching the picture very briefly, and or sketching a picture of the problem very briefly, and then you're going to draw all of the forces acting on the object. Now, sometimes you can get away with some shortcuts by only drawing the forces that actually matter, but since you guys are by definition novices, err on the side of too many forces, and then if things don't, um, if, if forces are not relevant, they're going to cancel out. So here you can see a problem where you have two uh, ice skaters putting, pushing on a third skater. Um, you should generally, uh, so start with, if you write our, um, our list of what we're going to do, one, you are going to uh, sketch what's going on, two, We'll say draw a coordinate system. Three, you're going to draw all forces. Then you're going to add them up to get the net force. Okay, so here you can see the overhead a picture of two skaters pushing on a third skater. We are going to draw our coordinate system, X and Y. Um, the first skater pushes with a force F1 in the X direction, and the second, for the second skater pushes with a force F2 in the Y direction. Um, we're not given the magnitude of those, uh, those forces, um, so we can... So we're going to write this more generally. So F1 equals the magnitude of F1, x hat. F2 equals the magnitude of F2, y hat. Now, um, technically, you have gravity and the normal force. Um, the normal force just means the force perpendicular to a surface. So um, in this case, the skaters are standing on the surface of an ice rink, and the normal force is perpendicular to that. We're not drawing that force. If we drew it, um, so here is that third skater. And then I can draw um, gravity and the normal force. The skater does not um, move up or down off the, it does not bounce off of the ice rink, and it does not go through the ice rink, so those two cancel out. Um, they turn out not to matter. So then we can write that the total force is F1x hat plus F2y hat. Now. You will often come across problems where uh, you are asked to draw the free body diagram. Different instructors are picky about different things. The way that I view it for my class is that the free body diagram is a sketch, which is designed to help you solve a problem. And I'm only going to grade it on accuracy to the extent that it helps you solve the, it helps you solve the problem or does not. Um, common problems include that people uh, miss forces or add extra forces. Um, usually you, so you want to think through and try to think of all of the possible forces that could be acting, but you do not want to add ones that are not there. All these extra forces are often just things that people are like, well, I know it moves in that direction, so there must be something I'm going to call F push in that direction. Resist the urge. If you cannot figure out where a force is coming from, it is not there. Um, Think it through, in most cases, think it through, because if you have, when I'm grading these, if I see an extra force or a missing force, that's when I mark points down. Um, now, technically, you have one free body diagram for each different object that's moving. So if you have the free body diagram on the third skater, you have the two forces from uh, the, the first skater and from the second skater. 
you also would have two free body, you would have a free body diagram um, for the other two skaters. So skater one, um, through one of Newton's laws, uh, every force has an opposite reaction, uh, uh, opposite force in the uh, exact opposite direction. So the force on, um, on skater one is F, uh, it, it, the, in this case it's the net force because there's only one force on that skater. It is F1, but it's in the negative x hat direction. The free body diagram on skater two is going to be a force acting in the opposite direction of the one that the skater is applying to the third skater. So it's going to be in the negative x direction. So the fo net force on, put another subscript one there and a subscript three here. The net force here is negative F two y hat. So then this problem, I have three free body diagrams, one, two, three, one for each of the skaters. The problem that was actually asked is something like, what is the net force on skater three? So you would not technically need these to answer the problem, um, but there might be other problems where you're asked to describe the trajectories of all three skaters as a function of time, in which case you would actually need all three of the force um, of the free body diagrams. Um, different people will grade these differently. I am usually, when I'm grading them, fine with people drawing the forces right on there. Um, it can be useful to have one of these free body diagrams where you just have a dot and in indicate all of the forces acting on each thing as a, a dot because it's a simplified way of representing things and that can make it easier to solve a problem. Um, if you are not in my class, ask for clarification. Mainly what I'm looking for when I ask for free body diagrams is that it is, a, it is an accurate tool to help you solve the problem. And then what you see, often when students are missing problems, they, uh, they mess up the free body diagram. They're not messing up later. Um, most of the actual physics is in setting up the problem, figuring out the free body diagram and figuring out all of the forces that are actually acting on something. So be very careful when you're doing that. When you're doing homework, ask a lot of questions. Make sure that you've got all of the correct forces. When you're on an exam, if there's, uh, when you're doing an exam, if there's any ambiguity in the question, just be sure to ask. I always tell my students to go ahead and ask questions because I can always just not answer. Okay, so here you have two different cases, one of which is really, really important, um, as in it's one of the archetypal problems that you will solve. So let's start with a box resting on a surface. When this box rests on the surface, um, you have, <coughs> it is at rest, you have two forces. You have the force of weight and the normal force. Um, the normal force is the force perpendicular to the floor um, and the weight is, uh, is the, um, the force due to gravity from the earth. Um, we know that the box is not moving in the x or y direction because it's just sitting there. The box is not going to fall through the floor. Microscopically, what the normal force is, is that the, the atoms and molecules in the floor, as the, as the box gets pulled down onto the floor by gravity, the atoms and molecules in the floor are at pushing back up on the, on the box. They are repelling the box, keeping it from traveling through the floor. Uh, and the normal force, so the normal force is never going to cause anything to bump, to, to accelerate through, perpendicular to a surface. It's only ever going to be just hard enough to keep the object from traveling through. So this is one of the cases where we have a, a force that is Actually, a microscopic force, we don't have a good analytical way to describe it, but it's always going to be whatever keeps, uh, whatever keeps some net force from acting in another direction. So this is really simple for a box sitting on a surface. Now we are going to have a box on an inclined plane. Bear with me here. This one is a little bit complicated. The reason we do this, you know, you cannot pass my class without knowing the incline plane forwards and backwards. So you're going to do problems where you have a box sliding down an incline plane 
with or without friction. And then later when we get to objects rolling, you're going to have boxes rolling down an inclined plane with or without friction and with or without slipping. Um, so we're going to add lots of details to this. Um, and it might, it's sort of an arbitrary problem. It, when, when you're learning physics, you're going, why am I learning this? Because when am I ever going to come up with this? Well, there are problems where you come up with this, but this is also one of the ways that we develop your skills for analyzing forces to figure out what to do with them when you're solving problems. In this particular case, the reason we harp on this is because the correct choice of coordinates makes this problem much easier. Instinctively, most of you want to draw your coordinate system like this, x and y. That is a perfectly fine coordinate system for this problem. If you are doing this problem, sure, that works. The reason it works well is because your forces are aligned with one of the axes or another. In the case of the blocks sliding down the inclined plane, you can actually do it in this coordinate system, but it's tricky. Here you have a constraint. The box cannot go through the floor. Um, so if you used this coordinate system right here, you're going to have to analyze the problem and figure out how to make the weight counteract the, uh, counteract the normal force and yet not um, counteract friction. So what you know is that the net force perpendicular to the surface has to be zero. That's hard to do in this coordinate system. The reason the net force in the, the perpendicular to the surface has to be zero is because the box is not going through the inclined plane and the box is not flying upwards off of the inclined plane. So what we're going to do instead is that we are going to draw a different coordinate system. And our coordinate system is going to be x along the plane and y perpendicular to the plane. Now, I've drawn it this way. I could arbitrarily choose x to be going down um, the plane instead of up the plane. Um, I could choose y to be going this way. The basic math is the same, except you differ by a sign. This is why one of the first things that you do whenever you're solving a physics problem is to draw your coordinate system. Drawing that coordinate system is really, really important because that tells you what the rest of the math means. Um, a clever choice of coordinate system is going to simplify everything. Later on, if you stay in physics, um, when you do complicated mechanics problems, you will see that actually sometimes it's easier to use spherical polar coordinates. If the problem's natural symmetry is in spherical is is spherical, you probably want to use spherical polar coordinates. In this case, there is a natural coordinate system, something that lines up with the forces in the problem that is along the plane instead of parallel with the surface of the Earth. Typically, in this problem, you are then given uh, in problems like this, you are given some angle that the plane makes relative to the, the surface of the Earth. Um, I'm going to call that angle theta. Um, and I would recommend going back through this one. As I said, you will not pass my class without demonstrating that you understand how to br break down forces in the case of something sliding up or sliding down an inclined plane. All right, now when we have our forces, actually, I am going to slip in a 3.5, which is, well, I'll just call, rename it, call it 4, um, right forces in terms of coordinates, and then you're going to add up all forces.
when we get to the next chapter, we're actually going to start using the sum of those forces to calculate um, how objects move. Okay, so now we're going to write the normal force in this coordinate system is now the magnitude of the normal force, y hat. Then we have weight. To get the weight, we have to do just a little bit of trigonometry. All right, so here... This is my weight broken down into coordinates graphically. And if this angle is theta, then this angle is theta. So in that case, the other thing I have, in that case, this angle is theta. All right, so then I can write the weight of the box. I'll just leave it as W, but for um, but we use the weight equals mg. So then we have m. We have the weight is the magnitude of the weight, and then sine theta x hat, and we can see from the picture that's in the negative direction, so I'm going to put a negative sign out in front. And then the, my y force is also in the negative direction, minus omega cosine theta y hat. So I want to look at one limiting case here. In the case that instead of an inclined plane, I just have a flat box, so I'm going to reduce theta to zero. I should get back to the answer that I have here, um, where the weight is, where the weight is entirely in the negative y direction. And so if theta is zero, cosine theta is one. So this is a negative w y hat. Sine theta is zero. So indeed, I get back to my limiting case here. The reason I'm going to do that is because even though I've done this problem tens of thousands of times, I am prone to sloppy mistakes. So instead of, instead of trying to not have sloppy mistakes, which is not going to happen, I'm going to, I'm going to cross check my work. Um, I'm going to sanity check it by taking cases I know that I should get um, and seeing if I in fact get the right, um, get the right answer. So I can tell that then this is in the, this is the right answer because in the limiting case, I end up getting the weight pointing entirely down. Now, we haven't talked about friction yet, um, so I'm going to tell you that friction is always going to equal um, some constant. We call it um, mu. We have a mu sub s for static friction, meaning the box is just sitting there. And we have uh, um, mu sub k for kinetic friction when the box is sliding. Um, mu sub, so mu sub k is going to be a constant. When a box is actually sliding, it will, um, you will have the same mu. It's just some, it's always a number from between 0 and 1. Um, and when you have an object that is sitting there, Mu, the physical constant mu sub s is the maximum value of um, the maximum value of mu that can that can be there. But friction is never going to speed things up. It's only going to slow things down. It's always going to act against motion. So anyhow, so friction is going to be mu, and then it's going to be proportional to the normal force. Um, so the harder that box is being pushed down onto the ground, or push, pulled into the ground by gravity, or any other forces, the larger that normal force is, the larger friction is. So if you have, um, if you have 
kids sitting on top of the box. There is there is more force down on the box, so uh, so the fr force of friction is going to be greater than if the box is empty. Okay, so then that tells us the magnitude, if this is kinetic, we're just going to assume it's kinetic. That's the magnitude of friction. And then for direction, it's going to depend on whether or not I'm pushing the box up the ramp or down the ramp. So the way that it's drawn on this picture, uh, the friction is acting up the ramp. That tells me that this diagram describes the box sliding down the ramp because friction is always going to counteract the direction of motion. So the way that it is drawn, this is a mu sub n, um, mu sub k n x hat. So it's in the x direction. And we're talking about a box sliding down the ramp. All right. Now, when I do this, I can write my net force is... negative w sine theta plus mu sub k n x hat plus n minus w cosine theta y hat. There cannot be a net force perpendicular to the inclined plane. So the y components have to be zero. And this is where the right choice of co coordinates pays off. If you had chosen this coordinate system, you could still apply this constraint, but it would be kind of tricky to apply. I, I can't do it off the top of my head. All right, so given that this is zero, that tells us that the normal force is equal to the weight times the cosine of theta. I can then plug this back in here, and I get F net equals negative W sine theta plus mu sub k w cosine theta all in the x hat direction. Now, why do I care? Newton's second law. F equals ma. The net force on an object is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So last time we talked about acceleration and how, given uh, how you solve kinematic equations um, and solve a few basic problems. Now, given that uh, if you can figure out the forces, you can figure out the acceleration, and then you can figure out how an object moves. So this is why we do these free body diagrams. We are after figuring out this acceleration, and then we can describe something's motion um, in all time. And we're actually going to move to that latter step in the next chapter, but now we're going to exercise our physics muscles and work on solving, um, on, on figuring out some, on drawing these free body diagrams. Okay, so this, now if I have weight equals mg and this equals ma, I can get that the acceleration is equal to negative g sine theta plus mu sub k g cosine theta x hat. Okay, a few things that I want to point out about this particular problem. They're really important. First, coordinate system. You are choosing a coordinate system which is not parallel to the ground. You are choosing a coordinate system which is lined up with the objects in the problem so that you can set the constraints easier. It's an easier way to do the math. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. So if you choose the right coordinate system here, you're making your own life a lot easier. 
If you choose the wrong coordinate system, you can sometimes get lost in a morass of algebra. OK, then uh, there were a bunch of specific things that were not fixed by this problem. When students start studying physics, they sort of, they, they often try to memorize everything. And well, this is the answer. This is your acceleration when you have a block sliding on an inclined plane. No, it's not. First of all, I made a choice here, which was ultimately somewhat arbitrary, about which direction that x-axis would point in. I chose to have it pointing up the inclined plane. If I had chose to have it, have it pointing down the inclined plane, I would have gotten this answer with a different sign. Second of all, here we were talking about the block sliding down the inclined plane because friction always counteracts the direction of motion. One of the problems that I like to ask, for instance, on a final is, all right, now you have a block with friction. You slide it up, it goes up the plane, and then it goes back down again. Now, uh, I will leave it as an exercise to the student. Um, that's, you see this sometimes in physics textbooks. They will say it is left as an exercise to the student. And sometimes that actually hides entire branches of physics. I'm not doing that to you here. Um, but if we have the block sliding, so here the block sliding down, if the block is sliding up the inclined plane, friction is in the opposite direction. And that means that I have a sign difference here. Let me go and try to color coordinate all of this. So if this is my friction instead, then I get a negative sign here because my friction is in the negative x direction. When I'm adding up my forces, I get a negative sign here. This, then, this term then has a negative sign, and that term has a negative sign. So if friction is acting in the same direction as gravity, the acceleration is larger. If friction is acting in the opposite direction of gravity, the acceleration is, is lower. Um, so when, when the block is sliding up the inclined plane, friction is slowing it down, but so is, um, so is gravity. So there's some arbitrary choices here that I made about the axis um, direction and about whether, well, this one's not arbitrary. That's a description of the physical problem. You cannot just say, well, this is what the acceleration is for a box sliding down an inclined plane. It depends on the problem that you were actually given. So when you're doing a physics problem, you have to read the problem very carefully. Make sure that you are actually answering the question which is asked. Typically, the problem that students have when they're doing these problems on, for instance, an exam, is that they're answering a problem, a question other than the one which is asked. They read too quickly. They assumed that they understood what the instructor was going to ask. Depending on the instructor, you, the number of points that you might miss for doing that can vary wildly. And some instructors are not as generous as others. So watch. Be very careful. Answer the problem which was asked. Then go back and also sanity check yourself. So um, that's what I was doing when I broke the vector into different coordinates and said, well, what, should I get a positive or a negative sign here? What, what should my answer look like? It does make sense um, when I'm talking about the block sliding up the inclined plane that it's going to, uh, the acceleration is larger because gravity and friction are going to slow it down. Start developing these cross checks. Think about that when you're doing a physics problem. Say, well, what should my answer look like? And I'm going to make sure after I've done the math that my answer actually looks like that. OK, this is another example. A mass on a spring. I love springs. Um, when you're starting to study physics, you often look at these problems. And you're like, why does that matter? How many problems in the world do you have where you actually have just a mass on a spring? That's it. I remember sitting in intro physics and going, I've never seen a mass on a spring in my life. You have. First of all, that's often a basic way to make a scale work is that you actually just have a spring. But second of all, 
Um, and I'll, I'll save some of the math for a little bit later so I don't overwhelm you. But it turns out you can approximate nearly everything, nearly every bound system as a mass on a spring. A spring is going, so here when you have, this is the wall and then this is your mass. When you have a, um, when you stretch something from its equilibrium position, the spring is going to pull it back towards equilibrium. When you push it, push the mass in, you're moving it from its equilibrium position. It's going to push it back towards its equilibrium position. So nearly everything that is in some type of bound state can be approximated as a mass on a spring. You don't need to appreciate it to uh, draw free body diagrams and figure out the net forces with a mass on a spring. But I think it can help to appreciate it because it'll tell you why you're doing it. So when you have a mass on a spring, the force um, from the spring is negative K, where this is called the spring constant. It is a property of that spring, delta X. You'll find different notations depending on the book. I like calling it delta X. So this is, indicates the vector from equilibrium. So if we go here, and I'm going to draw, if my box instead is over here, all right, my equilibrium position is here, my actual box is there, so the vector from here to equilibrium, this is my delta x, And the restoring force from the spring, by writing it as a vector, that's saying the restoring force has to be in the opposite direction. Stiff springs, ones that are hard to move, have a higher spring constant. Loose springs have a lower spring constant. Um, and yeah, this is super fundamental. It turns out that like entire branches of physics involve approximating stuff as a mass on a spring and then slightly improving your approximations um, by adding more springs, treat it, treating it as a mass on two springs with different spring constants and um, make, you know, in three dimensions you can model crystals as being masses on three springs, one in each different direction. And then it's like you can model the whole solid as a system of coupled masses on springs. And the math gets really hairy, but if you can solve it, you actually get something which is pretty close to the right answer because everything wants to be near its equilibrium position. And anyway, that's why you should care. This is what we, we treat it as. Um, this is when we're drawing, uh, when we're in intro physics and just drawing pretty little pictures. So, all right. There's two variations on this that you can have. Um, so, one is that you, have, you put your spring here. Um, this is a wall. And you are going to pull or stretch your um, spring from the wall. Um, so here, actually, I think this had it pull, you know, you have the mass and you have something you can pull it on. But Either way, you're, you're displacing it somehow. Now, if we draw a free body diagram right here where you've got some displacement, and we're assuming this is, say, sliding on an ice rink, um, or sometimes in, in your labs you're going to use air tables, which, um, which use air to keep things from touching to reduce friction. So here you've got a normal force because you always have a normal force and you always have gravity. So you've got normal force and gravity. Now, you've stretched the spring, so your equilibrium position is actually somewhere around here. So your delta x is like this, is in this direction. So your spring force is in this direction. Now, if we have the, uh, the mass sliding back and forth on an ice rink, 
we have the constraint that the mass is not going through the ice and it is not going, um, it is not flying off of the ice. So there is no net motion in this direction. I didn't follow my protocol. I've got my sketch and I drew all the forces, but I didn't draw my coordinate system. I'm going to use this as my coordinate system. Okay, if I use that as my coordinate system, I can write, I'm going to actually go down here, I can write that the weight is equal to negative mg y hat, the normal force, well, I know it's going to exactly counteract the weight, but for now I'm going to say I don't know. I will say leave it as n y hat, and then I have the spring force is equal to positive, the way I've driven it, drawn it, it's positive k delta x x hat. So note here, now in your definition, you have a sign, but that's got a vector on it. Your actual spring force can be positive or negative depending on which direction it, um, it is acting. So this is where you need your picture to make sure that you're getting the signs right because th there isn't any fundamental choice of, of coordinates. You're choosing the coordinates and depending on the way you drew the coordinates, you can end up with a positive or a negative sign in front of your spring force. Okay, so these are my net forces. I have to have a zero net force in the y direction. So I can take the y components separately and say n minus mg equals zero, which tells me that the normal force is equal to mg. A common problem when people are solving these physics problems is they'll be like, Oh, well, n is equal to mg. We actually had a, a, an example in the previous slide where n was not equal to mg because you had the block sliding down the inclined plane. m was, in fact, not equal to mg. So you, you can't memorize physics. You're going to have to use your brain. You can memorize a protocol for solving problems. All right, so this is your um, normal force and then your net force. In this case, is going to be K delta X, X hat. So what goes into the free body diagram? So here I can take the stuff that I wrote in green. That's my free body diagram. A lovely part about the flight board is that you can tell what I wrote versus what was on the, on the picture. As far as I'm concerned, you can draw it on your picture. If you're in my class, some instructors may have you do something different. All right. We will later talk about cases where, for instance, you have a spring scale. Oh, I want to do one other um, configuration with this. So this is if you have something sliding up or down, we will often have a mass hanging from a spring. All right, let's say it's at equilibrium. It's not moving. I'm going to draw the forces on this. I don't have anything in the x or y direction. I always have gravity. Well, not always. We're going to ask you problems about outer space later. And then I have the force of the spring. So I'm going to draw my coordinate system. I guess I'm doing these somewhat concurrently. I do that by habit. You may do it the way you want. This is x and y. And then what I'm going to do, so I have no forces in the x direction. My weight is equal to mg in the y direction. And because it's negative, and I drew the y-axis to be positive going up. This is negative mgy. You could choose to draw y to be positive going down. I've changed the sign. 
It's not going to change the physical answer. The physical answer is the magnitude and the direction of the acceleration. And that answer will be the same however you drew your coordinate system. It's just that if you flipped it, a negative y direction is going to mean something different. So you should always get the same physics answer however you draw your coordinate system. But the algebraic representation of that answer might be different. Uh, and that's something very fundamental. The physics is independent of the coordinate system. Should you stay in physics and get to relativity, that will matter a lot. All right. Then we have the force of the spring. The force of the spring is negative k delta x, well, or delta y in this case, because I'm looking at displacement in the y direction. It is, if I draw this, the spring's displacement in y, it's, the delta y has got to be negative because I'm displacing it, I'm stretching it down from where it would be without the mass attached. So then I can add up my total forces. F net is equal to negative mg minus k delta y, and then I can get delta y is equal to negative mg over k. So if I measure the displacement, I can get the spring constant. If I have the spring constant, I can predict the displacement. If I have the spring constant and measure the displacement, I can calculate the mass. And in fact, the latter is how a spring scale works. Things to point out. Um, later, we're going to get to talking to writing a full equation for the mass as a function of time. Where you set the zero matters. The way I drew this coordinate system, I didn't tell you well. If I set, put the zero exactly there, it'd be a little bit weird. If you put the zero at the equilibrium position versus putting it at the ceiling, you get different offsets. So be careful because you can have, you know, this describes the, this would be the displacement from the equilibrium position, not the absolute position in terms of y. Because I didn't tell you where my zero was. And then, later we're going to talk about springs moving. If you have a hanging spring, this is a new equilibrium position. So your equilibrium, equilibrium position without the spring is up higher, or, or without the mass is up higher than if you have, you have a new equilibrium position when you attach a mass. Pay attention to that. We'll come back later. Again, this all comes down to draw a coordinate system and be very meticulous about keeping the same coordinate system as you go through your problems and you're solving your problems. Because any deviations from that coordinate system are going to introduce mistakes in your answer. Okay. Here we have a student sitting on a chair. Now, a person is a very large object. And you can have forces acting on all sorts of, on you in all sorts of ways. So here you have the student propping their feet up on the chair and then leaning their elbows on the desk. To solve this, you sort of need to make some simplifying assumptions. The standard one is that we are going to approximate the student as a point particle. We are going to assume that there are primarily two forces um, and that you have the normal force of the chair on the student, and then you have the weight of the student. Now, as long as the student's feet are not leaving much weight on the floor, and they're not putting too much of their weight on the table, that's probably a pretty good approximation. Later, now you can think about what would happen in other cases where you consider these, now, obviously, if you're putting your weight on the table, if you're putting more force onto the table, the chair, you're putting less onto the chair. Um, and that, so if you had a problem like this, you would have to ask and ask about what, a, what assumptions you're making in the problem. 
All right, here you have a hockey puck being hit by um, a hockey stick. We often approximate things moving on ice as having no friction. Now you guys know that's not totally true. Um, we will later talk about impulse when you have the collision happen, exactly when the collision happens, but before the collision happens and immediately after the collision happens, you only have two forces. You have normal force and you have gravity. And you could, so here when you have the, so we, are, we often approximate friction to be zero, but of course we know that there is some friction. So if you wanted to take friction into account, you can tell from the swooshes here that the hockey puck is moving in this direction. So friction is acting in the opposite direction. So you could either draw these forces um, acting on, the, uh, on your sketch of the problem, or you could shift them over. Or sometimes it's useful to draw it like this and then come back and draw a little point diagram just to make sure that you're perfectly, that you understand perfectly what your forces are. If you get the forces wrong when you're drawing your free, free body diagram, you will get the answer wrong. Okay, and this is basically showing what goes on if you have um, an air table, um, an air hockey table, then there you blow air up so that you have the puck slightly floating. It's not actually making direct contact with the table. When it does that, it ha you can approximate this as having um, no friction, and then you are, you are only considering the forces in, um, you only have to consider weight and gravity, and then when something hits it. All right, Newton's second law is F equals MA, force, equals mass times acceleration. All right. A car is parked and a car is moving at constant velocity. Um, so in both cases, their acceleration is zero. If the net force, so if the car is parked, the acceleration is zero. Um, the velocity is zero, the acceleration is zero. If you're moving at a constant velocity, then your derivative of velocity with respect to time, which is the acceleration, is equal to zero. If your acceleration is equal to zero, then your net force is equal to zero too. So the net force on the car in both directions, sorry, in both examples, is zero. Now mind, that does not mean that the that the forces are the same, it means that the net force is the same. So if you are at rest, then you don't have any, um, you don't have any air resistance. If you have a car that is moving um, down the highway at 50 miles per hour, or sorry, 50 kilometers per hour, then there is in fact some friction coming from uh, some air resistance, or uh, there's some air resistance coming from the air, there's some friction coming from the, the wheels resisting rolling, um, and those both act in this direction, but the engine is providing a force in that direction. So the net, that means that the net force, that's how you get a car traveling at a constant velocity. Because as you know, even if you drive at constant velocity, you're still using gas. Your engine still has to provide some force to counteract the air resistance. Um, but in both of these cases, the net force is actually the same. And that can be, as you're entering physics, that can be somewhat counterintuitive because we sort of go, well, I know there's more forces in this case when the car is moving. There are more forces, but the net force is still zero. All right, now here you have um, a couple different um, examples. Students push a stalled car. Um, if you have <coughs> the external forces, so the external forces acting on the car are weight, you have gravity, so that's your weight. You have the normal force, which is acting perpendicular to the street. You have the force of each student pushing on the car. You could also draw those forces at the same origin. I would tend, if I were drawing this, I would tend, to, rather than drawing them um, 
head to tail, I would draw them both sort of like that. So you have the force, one force from each student pushing, and then you have friction from the um, car resisting being pushed. So again, friction is only ever going to counteract motion. Um, so if you, uh, and you can have static fr friction if they're pushing, but they haven't quite gotten hard, pushed hard enough to get the car rolling. Once they get the car rolling, you have kinetic friction. But your, your friction can never be larger than how hard they're pushing because friction is never going to cause the car to accelerate backwards. All right, then if you had a car on a tow truck, you would have, you'd still have friction. You got the normal force, you got gravity, um, and then you have the force from the tow truck. Now, in practice, of course, these are not all acting on the same point. So friction, the normal force, and gravity are acting where the car's tire actually hit the road, whereas the acceleration from the tow truck is, um, is applied on the front wheel. Um, nevertheless, we are modeling the car as a point particle because we are physicists. Um, and well, trust for now, trust us, you can get away with doing that. Um, it turns out to be a really good approximation most of the time. And then you end up with, to get the same acceleration, so you could get the same acceleration in both of these cases. All right, so that's how you draw your free body diagrams. For most cases, I'm okay with you just drawing uh, the forces directly on your sketch. All right, now you have a free body diagram. You have a basketball player pushing on a basketball. They, they give that basketball some acceleration. The basketball player could instead push on a car. Now, this says you have the same free body diagram. Now, technically, I could quibble with this because you um, here you are going to have gravity, but you're probably acting so quickly that you don't have to worry about the basketball falling while you're applying the force. And over here, you are going to have gravity as well as the normal force. It's just that these two happen to cancel out. So in this first case, you're approximating the situation as you can never neglect gravity. I could even get pickier and say, well, now you're, as soon as you're moving, you have some air resistance. And you're also going to have air resistance and friction acting on the car. So physicists like to argue and physicists like to always try to figure out what the hole in your logic is. I just drew a bunch of extra forces on these free body diagrams and in a real situation, those forces are actually there. How do you know when you can consider them? When you have to consider them versus when you can just neglect them? There is no one answer. The only answer I have, the, the, my answer is ask the instructor if the problem's not clear what you can approximate. Um, when you are, when you go out into the world and you're doing physics on your own without the guidance of your brilliant instructor, what you should do is sanity check. You can always make the approximation that you can neglect air resistance, that you can neglect gravity, that you can neglect, um, neg neglect friction, and then come back and try to solve the problem with those extra forces and see how much it mattered. How much does it matter whether you or not you include those? Or you can also try to make arguments for why you should be able to neglect air resistance and friction. Or why you don't have to worry about gravity and the normal force in this case, because it happens that they cancel out and they cancel out exactly. When in doubt, ask a question. You guys are new to this. All right, net force on a lawnmower is 50 newtons to the right. At what rate does the lawnmower accelerate? Um, so here you can draw the free body diagram. There's only one force that you're considering. Just like the previous problem, I can say, well, there is actually a normal force on the lawnmower as well as weight on the, on the lawnmower. Um, 
I would like you, when you're beginning especially, err on the side of including them. The worst case scenario, in a lot of cases, normal force and gravity cancel out and you don't have to consider them. If you've drawn them and you don't have to consider them and you have actually, you, have, you don't have to consider them because they cancel out, your free body diagram is still correct. So err on the side of drawing everything that's relevant. And if you don't want to, ask the instructor what you have to consider. All right, now you have um, cars moving at, um, sorry, a car moving at a constant acceleration and a car mo moving with an acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. Um, so in both, so what is our net force if you are moving at a constant acceleration? Zero. All right, so if our net force is zero, if our, if our acceleration is zero, our net force is equal to zero as well. Note technically that zero has different units, whether I'm saying that the force is equal to zero or the acceleration is equal to zero. I'm going to cheat and do it anyways. But technically those zeros have different units. All right, so here when I'm moving at a constant velocity, my, um, my acceleration is zero. Here, I am accelerating at 10 meters per second squared. I don't have to know what force the engine is applying and what force the what friction is. If I draw my free body diagram, I actually should have my normal force and gravity. I can tell you that given the acceleration, my net force is mass times acceleration. Um, so my acceleration, because I'm speeding up in that direction, my K1 so this is 10 times the mass, um, and this 10 has units of meters per second squared. So then I have x hat. So it depends on how hot, heavy the car is, what the total force is, but I can tell you, if I know how heavy the car is, I can tell you what the total, um, what the total force is. All right. Keep in mind, when the net, when something is moving at constant velocity, even if that velocity is zero, your net force is zero. A sled experiences a rocket slut thrust that accelerates it to the right. Each rocket creates an identical thrust, T. The system here is the sled, its rockets, its rider, and, and its rider. So none of the forces between the objects are considered. The arrow, representing friction, is drawn larger than scale. Okay, so here you have four rockets providing thrust. So when you draw your free body diagram, you have four thrusts. Again, I kind of would like drawing these all from, from the same point. Um, you can do it either way. Then friction is acting. Uh, friction always opposes motion. Um, so if your thrust is in this direction, unless it, unless it, it either exactly cancels out friction and it's not moving, so you didn't manage to get enough thrust to get the rocket moving, or your acceleration is in this direction, so your friction is in this direction. You have the normal force and you have gravity. So those are your forces, that's your free body diagram. Okay, then here, this one's a little more complicated. Here you have four forces applied to a particle and this problem is giving you the coordinate system. So here we didn't have to sketch or draw the coordinates or draw all the forces. We started with that. Now we can start by writing out each of the forces in terms of their coordinates. So F1 is equal to the magnitude of F1 and then cosine 30 degrees X hat plus sine 30 degrees y hat. 
f2 is equal to negative f2 y hat f3 so magnitude of f2 here I'm following the convention where whatever I named the force its magnitude is just the same variable without the arrow over it so this is now f3 is negative f3 y hat f4 is sorry f3 is x hat f4 is positive f4 y hat now i can add all of these together and f net i'm going to group my things that i have in the x direction and things that I have in the y direction. So in the x direction, I have F1 cosine 30 degrees minus F3 x hat, plus then in the y direction, F4 minus F2 plus F1 sine. 30 degrees y hat. Note, I'm putting my parentheses so that the y hat is multiplying everything. And here I have my parentheses where the y hat multiplies everything. Common mistakes include, oops, forgetting the vector. Always make sure when you check your work before you turn it in, make sure that you have a vector, on, if you have a vector on this side, you got a vector on this side. Watch your parentheses. Depending on how new you are to this and um, <coughs> how big the mistake is, I may or may not be generous. You don't want to count on my generosity with partial credit. So watch where you keep those parentheses. Make sure that you always have a vector equals a vector, a scalar equals a scalar, and do not set a vector equal to a scalar. The rest of the math doesn't matter. If, a if you put an equation down that says that a vector is equal to a scalar, it must be wrong. All right. Here, you have two forces acting on a car. It could, for instance, instance be the force of the car accelerating this way, and then it gets smashed and it's getting it's being pushed by some other car in that direction all right here i've got the sketch the forces are drawn i'm going to have to draw a coordinate system so we did show you how you do not always have to draw the coordinate system with x parallel to the the ground or the paper the horizontal axis of the paper and y vertical that is often strategic not to do that, but most times we're just going to stick with that standard coordinate system unless there is a good reason not to. All right, now I'm going to draw, I'm going to write my forces and I'm going to break it down into different components. So F, I'm going to call this, I like keeping things in variables until the very end. So I'm going to call this F1 and this is going to be theta and this is going to be phi. Why do I keep everything in variables? That's because it's easier to check mistakes. It is hard to learn to do this at first. It will feel a little unnatural. Most people, we are probably more comfortable working with numerical values than working with variables, but it pays to get used to it um, and start keeping everything as a variable until the very end. All right. So now I'm going to write F1 in terms of its coordinates. So I have the magnitude of F1 and then cosine theta. Now that's in the Y direction. And then a negative magnitude of F1 sine theta in the x direction. I put the negative sign because here I know my angle theta is small enough that 
Um, I'm not wrapping all the way around the axis. I could define theta as the angle with the x-axis, and then I wouldn't need that 90, 90 degrees, or I wouldn't need that negative sign. But if I keep the picture as drawn, and theta is the angle made with the y-axis, then I need a negative sign because I end up with an x com a negative x component in force 1. Force 2 is F2 cosine phi y hat plus F2 sine phi x hat. I could have written the x component first or the y component first. I'm used to writing the cosine term first. A lovely part about using unit vectors for writing out your vectors is that it can be, um, doesn't matter which order you do it in, so you can do it in the way that makes most sense to you. So we're going to sanity check this. So if I have um, theta equals zero, I should end up with everything in the y direction. And if I look at my equation here, that's true. If I make theta equals 90 degrees so that my cosine is zero, um, my sine at that point is one, and I should end up with everything in the negative x direction. And I see that I do. It may seem silly. Uh, you should get in the habit of doing those cross checks with, before you move on when you are breaking vectors into their components because it's really easy to make simple mistakes. All right, now I add together, I get the net forces. I'm going to group together my x and y components. F net, this time I'm going to put x first. F net is F2 sine phi minus F1 sine theta. And my y components are F2 cosine phi plus F1 cosine theta y hat. And I dropped my hat there. Okay, so... You can also sanity check here. Usually there's some symmetry to physics problems. So you should have a sine and a cosine come out in both of your answers. So if you accidentally transcribe stuff incorrectly, you write sine here. Well, why would you have two signs? <coughs> you also, uh, wherever you see, you should be able to swap the forces F1 and F2 um, and get qualitatively the same thing, except pointing in the opposite direction. All right, so then if I had to write down what this is, the x component is going to be 450 newtons times sine of 30 degrees minus 380 newtons sine of 10 degrees. And you see that if the picture is drawn vaguely to scale, I do recommend trying to draw your pictures roughly to scale. If the picture is drawn vaguely to scale, you should have a positive x component. And then your y component is, now your y component should definitely be positive because both are acting in the same direction. 450 newtons, cosine 30 degrees, and then plus 380 newtons, cosine 10 degrees. Okay, so I want to point out a few things, even though I'm not plugging in the numbers to get the final answer. I am writing units on everything. Get in the habit of always writing units. A number is meaningless without units. I am writing units even for my degrees. Technically, degrees and radians are unitless because degrees and radians are ratios of different quantities. But I'm going to write them as I'm going to write the units. First of all, it's really easy to get radians and degrees swapped, and second of all, um, it helps me keep track to treat it like a unit, even though technically it's unitless. One of the things that you're trying to do in this class 
is develop good habits so that when you move on to more advanced classes, you already, you're not going to make as many stupid mistakes or, well, actually, you're going to make as many, you're going to catch them better because you're going to do things more meticulously, even if now it seems a bit annoying to be this pedantic, you're going to keep doing it because it's going to lead to fewer stupid mistakes. All right, here's an example of turning the problem around. You have, uh, you know your net acceleration, you know your weight, so weight equals mg, um, and you're accelerating upwards. What is the force that you have to do to apply to accelerate that, to accelerate something upwards? So now F, here I'm going to draw my coordinate system. I'm going to put Y here, X here. So here I'm given 1, the sketch, and the forces, 3. I'm going to draw my coordinate system. Even if it seems glaringly obvious to you, draw your coordinate system. It might not be obvious to me when I'm grading. And in a large sample of students, not everybody's going to do the same, prop, the, the same coordinate system. If you draw your coordinate system and you make a dumb mistake, the, the clearer that you, and actually I should say silly mistake, the clearer you make your work, the easier it is for me to figure out what you've done and therefore, the easier it is for me to give you partial credit. Okay, so your force, you have a force, let me call it, let's assume this is an elevator. Um, so you've got some force from an elevator. The force from the elevator, we're just going to call it F elevator y hat. Then you have weight, which is negative m g y hat which you are given the um you're given the total force we'll, we'll also we can also write this negative w y hat and then the acceleration so now f net equals f e minus w y hat and that has to equal m a and you are given a is 1.5 meters per second squared in the y hat direction and it's positive so now i can tell you what force must the elevator apply the force of the elevator minus the weight uh, equals m a i can actually figure out the mass because here my mass is equal to my weight divided by g so i'm going to write this as m weight over g and then i can write the force of the elevator equals the weight plus m weight over g. Oh, sorry, I dropped my a. Sorry about that. Okay, so the four m a equals m weight over g times a. So The force of the elevator has to be 1 plus, uh, I believe, ah, I shouldn't have that M there. The thing that caught me was units. Okay, so here, mass is weight over G. I'm going to plug weight over G in for mass, and I, so weight over G times A equals the total force. I am going to move this guy over to this side by adding w, adding the weight to both sides. And I get weight plus weight over g a. And I can factor out the weight. So the elevator has to give a, the elevator has to have a much 
larger force to get it to accelerate up because uh, th rather than stay constant because you have to it has to be enough higher that it provides this additional acceleration upwards all right hopefully you're starting to get free body diagrams by now All right, here you have a swimmer exerting a force on a wall, um, and she is accelerating in the opposite direction. So she pushes on the wall with this direction, with, with this force. This is, this is Newton's third law, that, an ob, that when you, um, an object acting on something will provide, an, will experience an equal and opposite force. Okay, so she pushes on the wall, so the wall pushes on her. Um, and therefore, when you consider the free body diagram for the swimmer, there are three forces, her feet on the wall, um, the weight, her weight, and then the buoyant force, because she's, that is a, the equivalent of the normal force in water. So she's staying, assuming she's staying at the same height, the force on the of the water on her is roughly counter, is counteracting the um, force of, of gravity on her because she has no net motion in the vertical direction. All right. Now, you have a package sitting on a scale. If you think about what's going on in detail with those forces, so you have the what gravity from the Earth pulls on the package. The, um, the, there is a force from the scale on the package pushing the scale back up so that the package does not fall into the scale. That is perhaps coming, if this is a spring scale, that is because the spring is pushing back against the package. Then the scale is pushing down on the earth, and the earth pushes back on the scale. Um, so with the same force that, uh, that the scale is pushing on the Earth. So you can come up with pairs, uh, and then pairs of reactive forces. So because the package is pushing on, the is being pulled down by the Earth, the Earth is also being pulled on by the package. It's just that the Earth is so much heavier than the package that we usually neglect the force of the package on the earth. And we only consider the force of the earth on the package. And then you have uh, the, the package is pushing on the scale, so the scale is pushing on the package. Um, so you end up with these pairs of different reactive forces. Okay, and then um, we have we are considering systems. We talk about the forces on the system, but you don't worry about forces inside the system. So if you're standing on a train, uh, the, the earth is acting on you. You don't worry about the fact that, uh, you, you know, if the earth is acting on you, but it also has, leads to effectively the train looks heavier by your, it looks like it has a mass, uh, an additional mass from you being on the train. Um, so you could treat it as the mass of the train. And what you're really considering in these free body diagrams is the net forces on the system. So it really does matter what you consider the system. So in this case, if you're talking about someone pushing a cart full of demos, if your system is the cart, then the, the person pushing it is an external force, and you have to consider the fact that the cart actually pushes on the person as well. Um, and then you have friction with the floor. Um, if you consider the instructor to be pushing the cart to be part of the system, then you, um, you don't worry about this pair, but you do, in fact, have to worry about the... Um, Friction with the floor, um, friction with the floor, as the instructor walks along the flo floor. So, 
what you consider your system also impacts your free body diagram. In most cases of intro physics problems, it's pretty obvious what the easiest solution is. But when in doubt, ask, or if it's not a situation where you can ask, explicitly write out what you are considering the system. The more explicit you are in your answer, the more likely it is that the person doing the grading is going to be able to figure out what you did. Okay. Now we're going to move specifically to the inclined plane. We talked about the inclined plane a little bit, um, and we're going to study it in detail because it is so important. All right. So here we are given a problem. We have a skier going down a hill. We are going to consider friction. We have the forces already drawn for us. Uh, we will go ahead and draw the coordinate system, x, y. Because the skier is going down the hill, friction is going to counteract the force. Um, friction is going to counteract the direction of motion, so friction is going to go up the hill. Now we can write down our forces. So uh, we have weight is equal here. I'm going to leave it as the incline is theta. So weight is equal to negative weight and then sine theta x hat because I have my force is acting in the negative x direction. Here, if I look over at this triangle, this length is the magnitude times sine theta. This length is the magnitude times cosine theta. So I have plus omega cosine, or sorry, no, this one's also a minus because of the way I've drawn the coordinate system, minus w cosine theta y hat. Notice I'm keeping everything. I'm writing um, unit vectors everywhere to make sure that I always have a vector equals a vector. The normal force we will write as n y hat. And then friction is equal to mu sub k. It's got to be kinetic friction because the skier is sliding down the hill, so it cannot be static friction. Mu sub k times the normal force times x hat. OK, now my y direct my total force in the y direction here i'm kind of calling it f sub y because that it, it's easier than writing it as a whole vector my y components are n minus w cosine theta so just the whole y the y component is n minus w cosine theta that has to equal zero this tells me that n equals w cosine theta. I can then plug that into here and my force in the x direction is equal to negative w sine theta plus mu sub k w cosine theta. So the steeper the axis gets, the um, the greater I should have, the greater the acceleration. So my sine theta gets larger. So the larger the incline, the larger this term gets, and the, um, the smaller this term gets. Because sine goes like this. And cosine goes like that. OK, so that's skier going down a hill. I have fixed the friction. So down, the skier is sliding down the hill, so friction has to be up the hill.
All problems with an inclined plane are some variation of that, where <coughs> whether or not you consider friction and what the direction of friction is can change, and then you can choose to draw your axes in different ways. You might choose to draw your axes um, in different ways, depending, <coughs> for instance, on if you were told how far the sphere travels, you may not know enough to make it easy to draw them in a different way. This is just showing you the similar triangles that let you uh, see how theta over here is equal to um, is equal to your uh, is equal to this angle. So here you can draw a right triangle. And so this is a right triangle, and this is theta. Um, and then here, you draw another right triangle. And um, this angle has to be 90 degrees minus theta. So this angle is theta. And these lines are parallel, so this angle is theta. And I have another right triangle here. It's worth working out once or twice on your own. OK, strings and tension. Strings are always simply redirecting the tension. So tension is um, what's going on macroscopically is that the string is different parts of the string are pulling on other parts of the string. Um, and we model what's going on with the string by saying that it's redirecting a force. So in a very simple case, I have a string um, hanging over a nail, and I've got two masses. The string is just redirecting the force so that you can think of it as this um, this mass is pulling on that. Or if I draw it very carefully, I'm going to call this 1 and this 2. So if I draw my free body diagram for 1, um, I have the mass of 1 times I have weight equals the mass times g. And then I have the tension in the string. And then if I draw the, the free body diagram for 2, this is exactly the same. I have tension in the string, and the weight of 2. Now, these two tensions, because they are connected by the same string, I would call this the tension 1 and this is tension 2, the magnitude has to be the same because the string is only redirecting. Tension. So if I draw my coordinate system here, x, y, I can write that tension 1 is the tension in the positive y direction. And then weight 1 is negative m1g g m one g in the y direction. Now, the magnitude of tension 2 is also t, y hat, <coughs> and actually, let me draw three diagrams. There's also a force on this. So the uh, there's some normal force, and then I have tension 1. The tension from 1 is acting in the opposite direction on the nail, and the tension from 2 is acting in the opposite direction from the nail. So the nail is pushing up on both of them, and both tensions are pulling down on the nail. All right, so, but the tension is simply, re, the string is simply redirecting the tension. And here, weight 2 is negative m2g y hat. 
So if I have, uh, um, if they are all at rest, then I get that the tension equals, the net force is zero, so the tension equals M1G, and the tension also has to equal M2G. If they are at rest, then the, um, the two tensions are, have got to be, or sorry, the two masses have got to be equal. And then up here, the, the nail feels the force of both masses. So the, the string is simply redirecting where the, where the force is. So that's how we model strings as redirecting tension um, in the string. And in this class, we neglect, for instance, the string breaking. We're just modeling the string as redirecting the force. All right, so here you have a string. Well, you have some type of very strong rope. You have a mass. You can draw the free body diagram of the mass. It feels the weight and it feels the tension. And then if you're holding it, you know, there's some tension that is acting on your hand. It's going to be the opposite direction of the tension that is applied at the bottom of the string. Um, and so you're, what you feel, you feel like you are holding the string. Or sorry, you're hold, you feel like you're holding the mass, but you're actually holding the string. The string is redirecting the force of the mass. So you can draw free body diagrams. You could draw a free body diagram here of the, um, of the hand. You've got some force from tension um, pulling it down, and then you've got the um, force from the hand pulling it up. So you've got two free body diagrams that you could draw. So when you draw a free body diagram, you want to make sure you know which thing you're trying to analyze. Okay, so this is actually a reasonable approximation of, for instance, the, um, the tendons um, and the, the tendons in your body, they redirect a, a force similar to our model of strings. Um, and then it's also roughly how a brake cable works, where you're applying a force, but you're applying a force through a string um, that then, so you pull on the handle and then it um, pulls on the brake later. Um, in the case of V brakes, it's going to pull on it so that it, um, so that the V brakes tighten around the, around the rim. Okay. There's a series of lovely complicated problems like this that you guys will do in the class um, where you're analyzing tensions. So you have a tightrope walker. They have a certain mass. Um, if the tightrope walker is, um, so when they are standing there, this is an equilibrium problem. There is no net force. So if you have, and the tension has to act in the, um, you have a tension here from the left side of the rope and a tension from the right side of the rope. They both have the, um, if they both make the same angle, you can, with the, um, with the horizontal, you can then write out each of these forces. So the left force on the tightrope walker is going to be, so here, that would mean that this angle is theta as well. And this angle is theta. So you have the magnitude of the left tension cosine theta x hat plus sine theta y hat 
Uh, and I actually need to make this one negative because the it's a negative because the left tension is acting in the negative x direction. I can write something similar for the tension in the right hand direction. Except now this is positive in the x direction because the tension acts in the positive x direction. This should be an x hat. All right, and then I have weight equals negative mg y hat. So if I have an equilibrium problem, my net force is zero. The force in the y direction is TL sine theta plus TR sine theta minus mg. The force in the x direction is TL cosine theta plus TR cosine theta. If this, or sorry, there, this one's a minus. If this is equal to zero, I get that the left ten, the magnitude of the left tension equals the magnitude of the right tension. I can then plug that back in here. And two times the tension sine theta equals mg. The tension in the string has to equal mg over 2 sine theta. So the heavier the, um, the heavier the tightrope walker, the, um, the greater the tension. Um, you also could, given if you know the tension and the angle, you can calculate the um, you can calculate the mass of the tightrope walker. Tensions only redirect the force. You don't have to know the magnitude of the tension um, to be able to do something. So you saw here, I kept everything as variables. I slowly analyzed everything piece by piece until I could simplify things so that I could simplify it down to something that I could actually work with. Okay, so this just shows that same process. You're breaking each vector down into its components, and then you can add up the components, and if you have a net, um, a net, uh, no net motion, then uh, you can calculate what the tensions are, and as it points out here, your tensions are much greater than the total weight because you know, that string has to have a lot of tension to avoid being deflected when you stand on it. Okay, so here, if you are pulling on a tree trunk, if you, um, so here you're just redirecting, so you're gonna apply some small net force perpendicular to the tree, don't, don't pull a tree trunk out with car, not unless you know what you're doing or you want to break the bumper off of your car. Um, but okay, so we're going to draw our coordinate system, x, y. Here we're actually looking down on the system so that we can see what it does as you look down. Um, and we have, we will call this tension 1 and this guy is tension two. Um, actually, they will act on this point as tension two and tension one. So then the point, the, the vectors, the forces as they act on that point right there. Um, 
the, it is the same rope, so it has to have the same tension. So tension two is tension cosine theta x hat plus tension sine theta y hat. Tension one is negative tension cosine theta x hat plus tension sine theta y hat and the perpendicular force we will just call f perp negative f perp y hat okay so add these all together because we already used the fact that the tension is the same on the left and the right sides of the string the x the net force in the x direction is clearly zero and then we have the x in the y direction is 2t sine theta um, minus f perp. So your additional tension is going to be f. So this has to equal zero. So your additional tension is f perp divided by 2 sine theta. Sine theta is a small number. So the tension in the string just from pushing in that direction is going, it's going to go up very quickly because the angle is, is small. So just by pushing perpendicular, you're dramatically increasing the tension in the string, which means that it's easier to pull the bumper off. All right, this is our free body diagram for, okay, this is making the mass on, uh, um, the mass on an inclined plane slightly more complicated. What you do here is that you have an object A, which is held by a string um, on top of a mass B. So here, your object A experiences friction because B is sliding down and friction is going to oppose B moving down. So friction on B is going to be up the plane. So friction on A is down the plane. Let me go through that again. B, so A is tethered to the wall by a string. B is sliding down the wall or that down the ramp, because B is sliding down the ramp, friction between A and B is acting up the ramp. The force from, of A on B, it, A experiences the opposite force going in the opposite direction. So their friction on, of B on A is down the ramp. And then there's a tension in the string. There's the normal force of... Uh, of B acting on A because A is not falling down, and then there is gr gravity acting on A. Now, if we consider block B, um, you have the normal force. You have um, you have weight acting on block B, but you also have the normal force of A acting on B. So normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. So the normal force of A acting on B is in this direction. And then there's friction of the, um, the inclined plane, which is acting against B moving. So it's acting up the, the ramp. But friction of A, B is sliding down. So mass A is also, um, is also rubbing against B, and it's going to slow B down. So that friction is also up the ramp. So you can, complete, you can create all sorts of complicated systems where you have these masses interacting um, and get lots of different coupled free body diagrams.
if you're doing something like that where you have to consider the mass the the forces on multiple different objects then it is a good idea to draw your free body diagram slightly off to the side not exactly on your sketch okay here you have some tension in the string and i should mention we are unless until you get to points where you're wor you're considering otherwise um you're going to model the pulley and the string is massless so you're not worrying about what the pulley and the string are doing you're just saying well i'm not going to have to worry about that let's just um let's just neglect it so here you consider the free body diagram on mass two you have weight and then you have the tension in the string now if mass two well let's let's leave this as the um net force on two is i have to draw my coordinate system so i am going to do x and y um my net force on two is negative m to g y hat plus t y hat and then i'm going to come over here all right now my free body diagram here i have weight Normal force, tension, and just for good measure, I'm going to draw friction. The problem didn't say whether or not I had to consider friction, so I'm just going to consider that I might have to. So keeping the same coordinate system, I can write that my, no. I'm going to do this meticulously, so you see how to write steps step by step. The normal force is n y hat. The weight is m1 g y hat in the negative direction because it's acting down. Friction is equal to mu, we'll assume it's sliding, mu sub k n in the negative x hat direction and the tension is equal to uh, is equal to whatever the magnitude of the tension is and then this is in the positive x hat direction so my net force in the y direction is n minus m1 g this has to equal zero and therefore i get that the normal force is equal to m1 g now, I can write the net force in the x direction. This is equal to the tension minus mu sub k times the normal force, which I can plug my answer for the normal force back in here and get m1 g. OK, so. Here, if this is accelerating, let's say, let's assume that this is not accelerating. If it's not accelerating, the net force is equal to zero. And then I know that M2G equals the tension. And that I can plug back in here and say, that the well of course if this is not accelerating this is not accelerating either um and then that tells me that m2 g uh, <coughs> minus mu sub k m1 g equals the net force in the x direction so and this has to be zero because if mass two is not moving mass one is not moving or is not accelerating because they're tied together. So that would tell me what the magnitude of the of, of friction is um, on mass one. 
All right. So I can come up with all sorts of complicated coupled um, systems. Uh, and, and the book has many complicated problems like this. Um, I've advised that you guys take, uh, that you buy 3,000 solved problems in physics, which goes through many problems as well that are complicated. Um, the basic idea is the same. You draw a, force, a free body diagram, you sketch all the forces, you draw your coordinates, you break them down into pieces. You sometimes have to think step by step by what your assumptions are in each case, and then you can chug along and get the net force. Uh, okay, so ah, this was doing the previous problem, saying this neglected friction. So then you would get that the acceleration of the block is just M2G, <coughs> the acceleration of the first block. So if the blocks are not moving, you must have friction. Here is an example where you have two coupled carts. Um, your book has a couple of examples like this. We're going to call this theta. We're going to call this phi. OK, let's neglect friction. Um, and then we can move here. So our we will, for this one, draw x in this direction and y in this direction. And now you have um, you have weight in this direction and tension here and normal force here. So. Then I can write for uh, M1, normal force equals magnitude of normal force y hat. The uh, tension equals the magnitude of the tension x hat, the weight. Okay, that is theta, so I get M1G and then cosine theta, a negative y hat, M, a negative m2g sine theta x hat. My net acceleration in the y direction has to equal zero. So I have the normal force equals m1g cosine theta. And then the, in the x direction, I have that the acceleration is T minus M2G sine theta. And that is going to be M2 times the acceleration uh, of 2. And this going to be my answer so far for mass. Oh, why did I put twos? I was doing everything for one, and then I suddenly put twos at the very end. I should not have any twos in this problem. And then I'm going to put a two. I just wanted to put a two there. All right, correcting my mistakes. All right, now we're going to use, we're going to do this one. We're going to use a different coordinate system for this one, but we are going to choose to have x pointing broadly in the same direction so that the acceleration of mass 2 has the same sign as the acceleration of mass 1. Then for mass 2, I have a very similar free body diagram. Um, I can write the weight. And this is 
five. And then um, I have the normal force and the tension. So now I can come back over here for mass two. And now I'm using a different coordinate system for mass one and mass two. For mass two, uh, I have the normal force is equal to the magnitude of the normal force. I could even put a one here and two here. Uh, y hat tension. Now here the tension actually does have the same magnitude for, uh, for mass one and mass two. So this is then the tension is acting in a negative T x hat direction. Weight is m2 g cosine phi in the negative y hat direction and a positive m2 g sine phi in the x hat direction. Now, I want to point out the signs are different here. For mass 1, x is positive going up the ramp. For mass 2, x is positive going down the ramp. So this is where it matters what convention I use that's going to change everything. All right, total forces. In the y direction, my total force is 0, so n2 equals, um, so n2 minus m2g cosine phi has to equal zero, so I get N2 equals M2 cosine phi. In the uh, X direction, this should have said X. In the X direction now, I have negative T plus M2G sine phi, and this has to equal M2A2. And this is my answer so far. Now, because they're tied together, A1 has to equal A2, and we're just going to call that A. Then I can set these equal. Well, I can divide by m1 and m2 and set this equal to this. So t over m1 equals, or sorry, t over m1 minus g sine theta equals negative t over m2 plus g sine phi. Now I can calculate the tension in the string, simply from the fact that the accelerations have to be the same. So I'm going to put my tensions both on this side, my sine theta and phi on that side. T over m1 <coughs> plus t over m2 equals g sine theta plus sine phi. One way I can tell that my answer is same is that I have symmetry, that I can flip the, the phi and the theta and the m1 and the m2, and the equation looks the same. There's nothing special about which one I call which. So I would expect that they can be totally symmetric. And then this is equal to t times 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2, which I can rewrite as 
T times M1 plus M2 over M1 times M2. We sometimes define the quantity reduced mass as the product of two masses divided by the sum because that actually comes up a lot in physics problems. So this is the tension divided by the reduced mass. And you get that the tension is equal to this reduced mass G sine theta plus sine phi. All right, so what you do, you start this problem looks nearly intractable at the beginning. Draw your free body diagram. Draw coordinate systems. Slowly break each thing in, into pieces and chug, and you will eventually end up getting something useful. So you can see from there that by, from the answer that if you have the masses and the angles, the tension in the string is fixed. I didn't even say what the acceleration was. I just use the fact that the acceleration has to be the same for mass 1 and mass 2. So, use this process. Start by writing, drawing a picture and writing everything down. Break it into chunks. Chug along. You will eventually get, if not to the right answer, if you do it without mistakes, you get to the right answer. All right, so now we're going to do, um, we're going to go through some of the exercises in the book. Now let me mention what I do is that I don't actually look up the text of the exercise. I just talk about how you can approach it. So I'm not going to do the actual problems, um, just guide you in how to set it up. So here you can see you have a force acting down on this mass as well as another force. We're going to call these two different um, forces, so we'll call this F one acting down on a mass and F2 acting parallel to the, to the, um, to the surface. We can draw our uh, free body diagram. We have, well actually we'll start with a coordinate axis. I'm gonna, I see no reason not to stick with the standard X and Y. Um, and then we're gonna proceed from there. Um, so now I can draw the free, free body diagram and now we have F1, which makes an angle of 30 degrees with the x-axis. We also have F2, which is parallel to the x-axis. We're going to have the weight and the normal force. So this is an example where the normal force is not equal to the mass times gravity. Um, we can write down each of these forces. The normal force is equal to the magnitude of the normal force times y hat. Weight is equal to capital M, because this one is called capital M, times G y hat, and it is in the negative direction. F1 is equal to the magnitude of F1 cosine 30 degrees x hat minus the magnitude of F1 sine. Actually, I'm going to put a theta in because I put theta on the diagram. I like to keep variables until the very end. Sine theta y hat. I, um, so here the y hat component is negative. Um, so the, um, so I know that the, um, so I know I'm going to put this negative sign out there. F2 is equal to the magnitude of F2 x hat. Now, I am, the, the force here cannot make it go through the ground, so I can write my total y components as n minus f1 sine theta minus capital m g 
this has to equal zero. So in this case, my normal force is larger than the force due to gravity. Um, if I had had F pointing up, I could have ended up with a normal force which were less than, um, less than the weight of the object. All right, then my X, my net force in the X direction is going to be F2 plus F1 cosine theta. All right. So, always following roughly the same procedure, draw a sketch, draw your coordinates, draw the forces, and then start breaking things down into components so that you can add them all up. Springs. We talked a little bit about springs earlier. Um, so, here we can see a few different figures. A spring exerts a force, so a spring exerts a force proportional to its displacement. That is the force is equal to negative k delta x, written as a vector. So it's in the opposite of the, the direction of the displacement from equilibrium. Um, when, there, when it is in its equilibrium position, it, it, there is no force on the block. When it is compressed, uh, the force, which is also called a restoring force, acts to push the block out, push the block back towards its equilibrium position. When it is stretched, it also acts to push the block back towards the equilibrium position. The difference is that it is in the opposite direction. All right. And with that, we're going to wrap up this chapter, and we'll see you guys for chapter six.